Sako is a Sako that recently launched Sharia compliant banking and today we have the honor of hosting the CEO to explain further on this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Anur. Thank you, Halima. Thank you for having me to the show as well. Uh, briefly, give us an introduction of Stima Sako. Well, Stima Sako is an institution that was formed in 1974. So that means we are 47 years old to date. Initially, at the very beginning, Stima Sako was a Sako for the East Africa Power and Lightning Corporation which was encompassing the three East African countries. But as you might be aware, back in 1970s, there was the disintegration of the East African community. And then from there, you had the individual power companies, like in our case in Kenya, you had KPLC. So from an initial membership of only five members uh, of the then Kenya Power uh, Lighting and Corporation, um, we ended up having uh, about 148,000 members currently. So initially, Stima Sarkoz, you can imagine the name Stima, uh, means electricity, right? Yeah. yeah, so initially Stima therefore was for Kenya Power, but also with the liberalization of the energy sector, uh, they came Kenjen, they came Ketraco, Rare, GDC, um, all of those energy sector companies, they also became, their staff also became our members. But around the year 2010, there was a change in the legislation that enabled us to open up a common bond. So you might be surprised that out of the 148,000 members we currently have, actually a minority are from the energy sector. A majority of members are from everyone else. They're business people. Um, you'd find farmers, you'd find bankers, you'd find TV presenters, hosts. Any Kenyan outside there is, is now a member of STEMA. And the way I'd like to put it is this way. Uh, do you use a phone? And what do you use a phone for? Do you charge that phone? Do you use electricity in your house? So if you use electricity in any form, then you can become a member of STEMA. So STEMA is open to any member of the public. Recently you launched a Sharia compliant kind of a banking system. What drove you into Sharia compliance banking? Well, 20% um, hmm. uh, of Kenyans, uh, especially 20% uh, of Kenyans are Muslims or thereabouts. And what we found is that um, the Muslim community is more or less um, uh, on, on the outlier of financial inclusivity. This is because of the belief in the Sharia principles and of course the discussion around riba, which is interest. And for a very long time I found that we had members who would not take dividends from us. We pay a very good dividend rate of about 14%. They never take it. They'd say, you know, obviously and correctly, that was not halal business, it was haram. Uh, we used money for money to get the business for us. So I found that a lot of our members are, are missing out on financial inclusivity. They're unable to take their children to school, they're unable to pay their medical fees, they're unable to buy assets. Because of that um, uh, gap that exists of lacking financial inclusivity. And this is what made us think, okay, hold on. If you look at the bigger banks in Kenya, uh, if I might just mention Barclays, KCB, um, uh, if you look at these banks, uh, the former Chess Bank, what you see is that all of these institutions, National Bank of Kenya, all of these institutions are pretty much conventional banks, but they have Sharia windows. And of course the question became why? What is it that the banks are seeing that we in the SACO sector are not seeing? So the banks have, have, have been able to open a Sharia window and still retain their conventional business, but uh, they're able now to accommodate uh, the Muslim woman that has been unable to get financial inclusiv inclusivity. So I think that was the main driving force, that there was a need behind it. Uh, in every AGM we went for, there's a lot of clamor around it from our membership. And, and do remember, and maybe I need to start from there, um, there's a fundamental difference between a bank and a SACO. And, and the fundamental difference is that in most instances, I mean with all due respect with my brothers from the banking sector, I do consider them an association of capital. It's money coming together. But we in the SACO sector are an association of people. 
So it is people coming together. So there's ownership. You get ownership into Steamer Circle. You pay your share capital of about 25,000 shillings or so, and you become an owner of that institution. And by virtue of being an owner, you have rights and you have demands, which is basically what we said we need to address. So the demands of our members, who are our owners, we don't have customers, we have members. So the demand of our members is that they were lacking financial inclusivity as far as Sharia was concerned. And hence the journey began, it's been a journey of more than six years before we came to this. Uh, personally for me, um, I attended a couple of conferences, especially around Islamic finance, um, both regionally and internationally. And, and what really amazed me was that it was not the Muslims per se who teach on Islamic finance. It was our Christian brothers. And then I kept on answer, asking myself, what is it that they know I don't know? It is expected that because I'm a Muslim, then obviously I know Islamic finance. The answer to that is no, that's wrong. You have to go to school, you have to learn, you have to understand the principles of Islamic finance, then based on the Sharia law, for you to really say you're offering Islamic finance. So it has been a journey of six years or so of discovery, even for myself as a Muslim, to try and understand and get to know my own religion a bit better. But most importantly is also to understand the fundamental part of the business of Islamic finance. MashaAllah, you've mentioned there's a difference between the banking uh, sector and the SACO sector. What does it take for a financial institution, in your case, your SACO, for it to become Sharia compliant? So um, I think we need to start with where Islamic finance commenced from. So around the year 2008, um, in Kenya, was the first fledgling of the Islamic financial institution in terms of a bank. Um, and if I do remember around 2017, uh, there was the, is it the banking? No, no, the Finance Act, actually, of the year 2017. Um, went ahead to make changes um, with regards to various laws in Kenya. So you talk about the CMA, the Capital Markets Authority, um, you talk about the Corporate Societies Act, which governs us, uh, you have the IRA, and the like and the like. There are very many, the Stamp Duty Act, they're quite, 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 quite a lot. But the key thing here was that it was making reference to what had happened in 2008, that uh, Kenya had come to an edge and that there was room for Islamic finance. So think about um, um, even insurance in, in terms of Islamic uh, insurance as well, uh, takaful. So it is from that premise that we were able to pick on the law and to say, why is it that in Kenya, banks are able to do Islamic finance, so why not for Stima? And, and I think you need to understand our mindset. Uh, and our mindset is this. There are 42 banks in Kenya in total. Uh, we are larger than most banks in Kenya. We have an asset base of 42 billion. And we kept on asking ourselves, why, is, why are these smaller institutions, some of them smaller institutions, offering a service that we are unable to offer? We do agree that our members are multi-banked. But on the other hand, as a circle, it is for our benefit, for long-term sustainability, to ensure that anything that they need outside there, they can actually get within. So it is from that premise that we came up and said, what does the law say about Islamic finance? We went to the Cooperative Societies Act. We got to see models that had been applied by the Commission of Cooperatives, who has been very supportive, and the PS, um, Ali Noor, has been very, very supportive as well. So we looked at the bylaws that they had created for the cooperatives uh, in terms of Sharia. However, there was something missing. What was missing is that Stima Sako is a conventional Sako. But what the ministry had done was purely for the Islamic financial institutions. And therefore, a conversation began. We are conventional. We see the banks do it. And we believe anything any financial institution can do, we can do, and we can actually do better. So we went to our regulator, had a very deep discussion around that. But internally first, like I'd mentioned, starting from myself, I had to understand Islamic finance. And the first thing that I did was to join the Ethica Institute of Islamic Studies, uh, where I, go, I got a certification. I'm a certified Islamic financial executive. I, have, I also have, uh, it's called a CIFE, CIFE. I'm also a CIFE in accounting and a CIFE in financial analysis. So the idea behind that was to truly understand you know, the, the bolts and the nuts of Islamic finance. And, and to be very honest, I, 
I was, I was a bit uncomfortable being taught by non-Muslims. And I felt, okay, hold on, I'm a Muslim. I need to know these things. What's happening? I mean, why would I be taught by non-Muslims? And, and that became the challenge for me. So from there, I've trained more than 14 of our staff as well. More than 14. They're under taking the CIFE course. Majority of them have passed, about six or seven, uh, through the whole value chain of that institution. So it's a difficult question to ask because it starts from the very structure of who we are as an institution. We are a SACO. We have a board, we have board committees, so we had to come up with the Sharia Advisory Committee as well. Uh, the only SACO in Kenya with the Sharia Advisory Committee, a convention on SACO with the Sharia Advisory Committee. And that meant convincing also the regulator that this is not beyond, we have what is called seven cooperative principles, that we're not breaking any of those seven cooperative principles. And in any way, that those seven cooperative principles are aligned to the Islamic finance. So we started internally. Uh, got to know what we don't know, uh, got the knowledge, the understanding, brought in the experts from various banks. I'm very thankful for, for very many banks, including Gulf African Bank, uh, the CEO, a very good friend of mine, really supported me in terms of coming up with that initial idea. Just somebody you can bounce off ideas with. And from there now we are able to go ahead and uh, have the Islamic finance. Mashallah. Let's talk about the four products you recently launched under the Sharia Compliance Day. So, um, in terms of products, what we did, um, perhaps I need to um, explain the conventional side. Yeah, go ahead. And then I can bring in the Sharia bit. So, as a circle, as I mentioned, when you become a member, you pay 25,000 bob, and, and that is your shareholding, and, and you become an owner. So, we've been giving a return on that, 14%. Obviously, that's interest. Haram. <laughs> uh, we've also, as a member, once you pay the 25,000, you also bring in an, <clears throat> an element of uh, alpha deposits, monthly contributions that we've actually been paying an, an interest rebate on, again, another riba. So what we did was to ask ourselves, how do we ensure that all of this is Sharia compliant? So there are various principles to apply, like Sukuk. So Cook is certification, whereby you can be able to own an ownership in an institution and get a return from that institution as long as the income being generated is not riba. So the products that we have are predominantly what you call asset-based, and, and maybe that's where we need to start. What is this thing called Sharia product? What is Islamic finance? It's very simple. Islamic, uh, Islam has no problem with money. Money is purely a commodity. It's a medium of exchange. That's what money is. Money is not good, neither is it evil. It depends what you do with it. Now, what makes something riba or something of interest is the perspective that, Halima, you ask me for 100,000 shillings. And I tell you, okay, it's, it's okay, I'll give you 100,000 bob. But I'm telling you, from 100,000 bob, um, you need to give me 110,000 back. An interest element. That is the riba bit. However, Halima, if you to come to me and to say, um, I need a laptop, as an example. It costs me 100K, and I want you to finance for me. Buy this laptop on my behalf. So what Stima would do, or any Islamic financial institution, would be to go ahead and buy the laptop and agree on a profit margin, because it's a business that I can charge you. So the underlying principle around Sharia, or around Islamic finance, is that it has to be asset-based or asset-backed. So majority of the business that we do in terms of con conventional is not asset-based. It's a member coming and saying, just give me money and we give it out. But one of the key components of making sure a product is Islamic, uh, is within the Sharia compliant, compliant is really to have an asset-backed. It has to have an asset behind it. So let's discuss about the profit that I'm going to incur by virtue of having gone ahead and actually bought this commodity and handed it to you. This is the same principle you use in terms of business. If you go to a shop and to buy something, that person bought that at item at, at a particular cost price, but they put a markup on it to sell to you. So that is very compliant. There's no interest involved. So for instance, it's a car. You buy the car on on my behalf and uh, there's nothing I'm giving in return in terms of money extra cash if the car costs a hundred thousand for instance maybe give you land 
was the same amount. That's now what you guys will use in terms of now to remove the riba part of it. No, the riba part will be removed from the car itself. The car is the asset. The riba bit here would be, you say, I want two million shillings, give it to me, I'm going to buy a car. And I give you two million bob, and I have no idea what you're doing with it. Probably you never went ahead and bought a car. You bought a house or bought something else. So the asset part means this, is that you come to Steamer and say, I want to buy a car. I've gone to DTW, I've seen this nice, I don't know what car you like, <laughs> a RAV8 or whatever it is. So I'll go to DTW and buy the car for you. On top of that, I'll add a margin for myself, which is the profit, and sell to you. Mm, that's not RIBA. It's not RIBA. RIBA element is the asset back, is the lack of the asset back element of a transaction. RIBA is me saying, take two million shillings or borrow two million bob, and there's nothing in between. So, and, and look at it this way, and from time in memorial, including the time of a prophet, peace be upon him, there was trade. But was trade based on cost? And then how do you survive? And look at that. Farmers would go ahead and plant their debts and they'll sell them. So are they selling it at cost or they sell it at a profit? Islam does not forbid profit. Islam forbids riba. It's the interest bit. And the interest is coming about because there's nothing, there's hewa. You're giving money for money. And that is what most banks, most conventional circles do. They give you hewa for hewa. One million, take a million bob, 10% interest rate. That is the riba bit. But if you come to us and say, and, and, and that's a very important point, uh, what makes you Sharia compliant is the part that we partake in the risk of that product. We actually buy it. Say you're buying a house, we do something called diminishing musharaka. So if uh, you have a house of what, 10 million bob, that's what you want to buy. Stimasako will go ahead and buy that house of 10 million and sell to you. As you pay out, diminishing musharaka means my share in the housing diminishes as yours increases. So if the house is worth 10 million bob, they are paying a million shillings, say every year, that means in the end of every year, the portion of your house is 10% and mine is 90 in the first year. The second year yours is 20, mine is 80. But I have ownership in that house. If anything happens to that house, we will incur that loss. That's not, that's not what banks do. Banks don't do that. Banks will tell you, go ahead, buy the house where it's your loss and no one, no one else's. So I think that's what I need to explain, that the RIBA bit is really the lack of having something that is asset-backed. Number two, a very important component of Islamic finance is certainty. If you're coming to borrow from me, and I'm telling you that this house is 10 million shillings, and I have a cost of buying that house, because otherwise it's at close shop. Uh, they cannot come and say, the house is 10 million, and, and therefore take 10 million, and that's it. That, how do we sustain ourselves? There's a cost element, and that is what the profit you're putting on board. The people you pay salaries, the processing, uh, you have to go charge the property, the lawyers were involved. So all of that you have to ascertain in your profit and to say, in terms of my profit, I need to take care of my cost. Otherwise, in a day or two, you'd have closed shop, isn't it? So the second bit, therefore, is certainty. And that means you cannot play around in terms of the amount of money you're supposed to pay. So say we agree the payment will be 12 million, including any cost that we do in car. I can all come back to you and say, hey, you know what, there's fluctuation, and CBR red, and because of that, we are going to change the pricing. The third bit is, uh, and that's what they call garar, uncertainty. The third bit is uh, contractual certainty. So you have to ensure that everything is, contract is, is, is actually written down, is on contract, is very clear for both parties, Again, so that you do not throw a curveball later on by introducing hidden costs and hidden charges. So you have to be very clear around that as well. I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm making sense to you. You are, but I don't, the point that I think even the audience would love to understand, with the Sharia compliance banking, how do you benefit as, a, as, an, institution? as an institution? Yeah. I talked about the profit. Yeah. You have a profit. So if you buy a product, I buy a product, I have a margin, and I sell to you. Now, look at it in the conventional sense. In the conventional sense, you just borrow money, and from the money, I charge you an interest, and that interest is what I share with you. So, for Islamic finance, there is sharing of profit and losses. 
If I incur a profit, I share with you. So from that transaction, at the end of the year, for those who have taken ownership into Steamer, I'm able to come and say, you know what, how much money did this line of business generate for us? And based on this generation of money, then how much money am I giving back to you? So that is one of the key components of Sharia compliance, that you're able to share profit with one another. Similarly, if you incur loss, <laughs> and I know this is a sensitive area as well, but in case you do incur loss, then if you have to think about the Mudarib or the Mudaraba uh, concept, would be able to share the losses with you as well. So there is profit share and there's also loss share as far as Islamic finance is concerned. You want to talk about the products? So the products themselves, I think I've sort of talked about them. Um, the first product we have is a sukuk uh, that enables us to have share capital. Uh, that, that is the ownership of, that, of the institution, whereby you're able to be part and parcel of the owner of steamer. Number two, we have uh, a product called, um, it's a card prime account. All our products are called Yasar. Yasar is an Arabic word that means wealth, affluence. And we are hoping that we'll be able to create that for our Muslim members. Um, so that's our second product. It's called Card. There, there is no cost whatsoever. In that particular one, you're able to put money into Steamer, like in a savings account or a current account. We don't charge you, you don't charge us. That's your money. So you trade freely. There's no cost. There's no monthly contribution. There are no monthly charges. And this will enable you to get access to things like checkbooks and our ATM facility. We are not yet there in terms of the mobile banking. Uh, for the mobile banking, we're introducing a product called um, Salam or Tawaruk. Now for this one, it will enable us to be able to buy, to, to, to be in a commodity exchange market, whereby we can be able to buy on your behalf, uh, if it's palm oil, uh, whichever business that they're doing on the other end, so that we're able to lend to you over the mobile phone. We're not there yet. It's where the bigger, more advanced uh, Islamic finance institutions are they able to lend to you by, via mobile. Now, this is why you, needs to, you need to be careful because, again, you cannot lend money for money. So what is backing that transaction behind the mobile phone? And in most instances, we have what is called commodity exchange markets. There are three main ones in the world. One is based in China, the other in India, the other in Malaysia. The one in Malaysia is called Bursa Malaysia. And in that one, it enables the Islamic financial institutions to partake in the purchase of commodities like palm oil, across over the, the commodity online exchange market. Uh, they're able to buy for you and also to sell on your behalf and also incur profit within, within that period. And the other product we have is around, um, I've talked about the diminishing musharaka. If you're buying a, a house um, and, and you're seeking us to buy that product and because you might not have the capacity of, of paying 100% at one time, you're saying, allow me to pay kidogo kidogo until the day that I'm able to reach 100% payment. So that is a diminishing musharaka. We actually have that as well. Uh, the other one is around the mudarab, uh, mudaraba products, which is really investment. What it means is that you give us money, allow us to partake in Islamic finance business, allow us to finance other, other people who are within that particular framework, from the money that we make, obviously we give you a profit back. Uh, it is almost the same as fixed deposit, but different, because in a fixed deposit you already know the rate. You're already told, you know, put money here, at the end of the year we'll give you 10 or 12% return. We don't do that. What you're saying, from the money you give us to trade with, we will trade the business in a halal way, and from that income that we generate, we're also able to give it back to you. Again, we go back to profit and loss share as far as Islamic finance is concerned. Mashallah, are the products only limited to your target market, which is the Muslim community, or are they open to even non-Muslims? That's a good question. Um, so what's our target market? The Muslim community, because <laughs> it's Sharia compliance. Uh, yes and no. Uh -huh. The product is very good for the Muslim community and the Ummah. Um, I grew up in Kibra, and maybe I needed to have started from that. And I remember when I went to Madrasa, there are a few things I was told are haram. And as I grew up, I really wondered, was that the right approach of being taught? Um, I remember being told, and, and, and this, this is a problem sometimes you find with our, with our teachings. Um, very rudimentary things, like for example, um, I should not board a vehicle, because during the time of the Prophet, the great prof Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, there were no cars. So 
So somebody will tell you something like that. Or do not partake in business. Business is haram. So in the neighborhood I grew up with, I saw a lot of poverty um, around the Muslim society because even doing a business, going, say, to Marikiti and buying onions and tomatoes, incurring a cost, putting a margin and selling it, to some people that was deemed haram. And that would mean that we will not partake as a Muslim society in business. And again, you go back to the days um, of the great prophet, peace be, peace be upon him, and you'll realize business was actually done. If you go back in history, you'd find that the Muslim society, I mean, we have the greatest minds, the greatest innovations came from us. So in terms of science, in terms of business, it is us who are actually there. So um, when I look at it from that perspective and, and coming back to where I am currently, um, the key thing here was to say, hold on, from the lessons that we've had in the past, are there things that now we are able to, to, to actually do? Sorry, I've, I've lost my track of thoughts. Your question again. <laughs> no, go back. Just no, go back. Just the question the was, uh, you've kind of corrected me. Your target market. Target market. market. Sorry, I went very far. <laughs> I went back into history. Yeah. So, so let me take you forward. So what I'm just trying to say is that Islam is not equal to poverty. That's not what we're taught, even if you're to read the Quran. It does not say live this life in, in poverty. Um, as a person in leadership, it is my responsibility to create opportunities for the Muslim Ummah. And that is basically what this product is going to do. However, this product is not just for Muslims alone. It does target Muslims, but it also targets 148,000 of our membership. And like I mentioned, 20% of them are Muslims. You'd find it very interesting that for the big banks, or the banks that are more established, a big percentage of those who partake in Sharia compliance are not necessarily the Muslims. There are also non-Muslims who have come to look at the aspect of equity, the honesty, the trust, trustworthy, the trustworthiness, the fair, uh, it's a very fair kind of transactions, the integrity around Islamic finance. That is what we are selling to our members. And even if you're not from the Muslim faith, and you come and look at these products, and these products speak to you, it's okay, you're able to partake in them. So Sharia compliance does not mean you lock out and exclude the non-Muslims. It just means include the Muslims into the financial inclusivity, which is basically what you're doing. So our target market is every Kenyan outside there, irrespective of their religion, their tribe, where they come from. As long as you're a Kenyan, you're able to partake in Islamic finances. And they should be open to purchasing the products, inshallah. Absolutely. There was a question from the audience. Some Muslims don't trust Sharia banking. They say there's a hidden interest in it. What are your views on that? It's a valid question to ask. And even I asked myself that question over and over and over again. But it goes back to the very understanding of what is interest. So define interest for us. Uh, profit is not interest. It's a very big difference. Profit is halal. Um, if you own a shop and you're able to buy bread today and you go to, who makes bread? Uh, whichever company makes bread or milk. And you come to your shop, you have incurred a cost, you've incurred transportation charges, you need to pay rent, you need to pay yourself to sit there to, av to avail that bread to the next person who's coming in. That is not haram. That is pure profit. And this is what the Islamic financial institutions are trying to bring into the picture and to say, even in terms of we don't lend, we finance you. So that there is something, there is an asset somewhere, there is something tangible I can touch and say I provide it to you. So once you bring in the aspect of asset backed, then the aspect of interest scissors and we start discussing an issue to do with profit. So in some of our products, we actually have to disclose to you the cost of the product together with our surplus on top. So there's nothing hidden around there. I bought a laptop at 100,000 bob. I'm willing to sell it to you at 110K. I have overheads to run. You cannot run a business on, 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 on not having a profit. Because if you're to do that, then you really destroy the very thing that you're trying to do for the Muslim Ummah which is to create awareness. If you want to open a business as a Muslim, you're allowed to open a business. I mean, some of the great businessmen we, we know, 
from time in mom in mom in in memorial, memorial. yeah uh, transcending from the arabic peninsula coming all the way using the indian ocean or traders so what were they doing were they selling things at a cost so there's a misperception that if i went and planted maize and the cost of planting maize is 10 bob then i must sell it at 10 bob no i don't agree to that and you putting a markup on top of that does not make your product any less sharia and it is not an interest per se it is purely a profit on your end having said that um you know at the end um uh, uh allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is really uh, the judge and let me speak like a muslim um as a muslim i fear the aftermath more than where i live today um and i hope what i'm doing is right and we all hope that but it's only the almighty god who will judge you and who will say yes you did the right thing or not so in in our genuine attempt as an institution we have tried to look at the best practices around the world also here in kenya and as much as possible to become sharia compliant there's always going to be work in progress there's always going to be an improvement we have a sharia advisory committee uh, we have a sheikh in the sharia advisory committee who will always tell us no 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 in terms of this what you're doing this is not right from a purely sharia perspective this is wrong and we'll always listen to that we also listen to criticism we also listen to feedback that that is coming from our membership <laughs> our products as we created them were not just created by us who are technocrats we actually went into the membership and we asked our members what do you think is sharia compliant are you okay with these products that you're coming up with do you have reservations from a purely faith perspective and once we're able to answer that we're able to roll out the product so uh, we'll do our best to become sharia compliant as much as possible we just started we just started off we are showcasing for the other circles in Kenya that this can be done and not just in Kenya in Africa and the world as well that being a sako does not mean that you cannot be sharia compliant you, have, you actually can be sharia compliant and we are hoping that from the lessons that we have uh, other people will be, able, will be able to benchmark from us and perhaps also learn from us and improve uh, any element that we might have not done properly but our will uh, inshallah is to be as sharia compliant as possible inshallah if we can look into your camera talk to your potential customers or the already existing customers inshallah All right. Uh, so again, um, Hassan is my name. The CEO at Stimo Sako. Um, as I've mentioned, we are a very stable institution. We have been here for 47 years or so. Um, our asset base currently is about 42 billion Kenya shillings. Our income that we made last year was about 5.8 billion shillings. We are looking to grow to uh, a 75 billion institution. We do realize that for a very long time uh, those who profess the Muslim faith have not had access to finance. We are hoping that you'd be able to look at the products that you do offer, our Sharia compliant line of business, and also for those who are not Muslims, also the non-Muslims or brothers and sisters, it's a product that is open to all of you. We hope that you'll be able to join this very great institution, uh, the second largest circle in Kenya and in Africa and be part and parcel of that growth of empowering you as our member for life. Halima? Mashallah, that's a brilliant way to wrap up today's episode. It's my hope and prayer. Inshallah, you've had a better understanding of what the Sharia compliant kind of a banking system is all about. A special thank you to you, Dr. Hassan. And inshallah, until we meet next week, same time, maybe. Probably back to the studio. This has been Anur with me, Halima Binti Omar. It's Masalama. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.